Amen. Wow, has it been great to be with you all. And I just have to tell you that I am more excited about this chapel than the other two because God met me personally last night in a story that I plan to tell to show me that he's still writing this story and he's still writing this story on your campus. And so I'm especially excited for how God is going to move in this service and want to pray right now just for open hearts, for your open hearts to hear that word from God. Lord, in the silence, we know you're at work. And the miracle is that you raise the volume on the words that each person needs to hear because it's a direct message from you. You know everyone's story in the room. And that's the story we're going to be talking about today. You know every story and you are so big that you meet people in their story personally while you're meeting everyone else's. What a God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for who you are. And if anyone is in here today that doesn't believe you are real, I pray that they would open their ears and at least consider the possibility today that you are alive. Amen. The story we're going to talk about today is a story that probably many of you have heard it's a story where four friends were so concerned for their friend who was paralyzed, and they heard about Jesus, and they knew they had to get their friend to Jesus. These are the kind of friends you want. These are the kind of friends you want. Because they literally moved heaven and earth to get their friend to Jesus. Jesus was teaching in a very crowded room. It was a house, actually, and there were not just people all over the floor, but way outside. They couldn't even hardly see him, and they knew they had to come up with a plan. So they decided, and I have no idea if they talked to the homeowner about this, but they decided to get up on the roof and dig a hole through the roof above Jesus' head. So I want you to imagine Jesus is teaching I don't care how captivating you are, if you see someone start digging a hole up here in chapel, you're going to be a little distracted. So this is going on in back of Jesus. So he knows something is happening because I'm sure he can see the eyes go from that to him, that to him. And all of a sudden, this mat lowers down with this paralyzed guy. Now imagine the guy. I mean, he's used to having no attention at all, being on the side of the road. He can't even move. And now he is center stage being lowered through the ceiling like Taylor Swift. Literally, probably just humiliated, wondering what in the world is going to happen. They lower him right in front of Jesus and the scriptures say that Jesus looked at the friends and when they saw when he saw their faith he turned to the man and he said this son your sins are forgiven now i don't know about you but i don't think that that's what those guys were looking for in that moment Son, your sins are forgiven? Jesus, we kind of wanted him to be healed. It's pretty obvious. Son, your sins are forgiven. And what I've seen in my life is so often God will have you in the middle of one story that you think is going one way and suddenly it takes a left turn. That happened to me the first time I went to Haiti. Years and years ago, I went on a compassion trip. And the reason I went is because I was speaking for Compassion International, and I was dating a guy who was a pastor at the time, had a large church. And so we were part of a group that was coming down to Haiti to just see what was going on down there, see the child sponsorships. And my story in my head was, now me and this guy will see what we're like in team ministry. 
because we're going to get married. He wasn't even the guy I was engaged to, by the way. I, I just thought for sure that was the story. We were in love, and I was in ministry, and he was in ministry, and I had written this story in my head. And we get there, and we meet another guy. He's directing our trip. His name is Ephraim Lindor. And I cannot describe to you this man. He had a smile as big as his face. His whole face was a smile. I'm not kidding. All you saw was teeth. He was just incredible. He was such a light in the midst of a very, very dark place. And as we drove through poverty, he knew everybody, everywhere. And he captivated me. And so we became friends. And as you know my story, my boyfriend and I ended up breaking up shortly after that. That's a whole story that I could tell you, but I don't want to get off track today. But Ephraim and I stayed friends. I want to show you a picture of he and I when I first met him. Look at that smile. And what happened was I got home and I said, Ephraim, I was going to sponsor another compassion child, but I feel like I want to help you. Now, he wasn't asking for that. He wasn't looking for that. He was the compassion director. I said, what, what could I do to just support your ministry? And he said, well, actually, I have a daughter that I'm trying to put in school, put through school. And because I work for Compassion, that's where I get paid. And my church can't pay me. I'm a pastor at a church. That would be great if you wanted to help. I said, I would love to. So this next picture shows his daughter as well as his son. And I became a part of his family. And I thought, what a great story. Because I was living in Orange County. I was adjunct teaching and speaking. And I thought this was the story, and it's incredible. I love her, she loves me, we have a great relationship. What I didn't know is that I was gonna get called to a church in Santa Barbara, and when I got there, they were doing mission trips all over, except for Haiti. And I said to the pastor, well, how about if I lead a trip to Haiti? And he said, well, that would be great. You get yourself a team and you can do that. So I got a team together. It included a doctor and several other people, some, one, a few in construction, and we went down there, and we just basically ministered at Ephraim's church. It's called El Shaddai in Port-au-Prince. And this became a yearly thing. Not only did it become a yearly thing, but for the doctor, his name was Dr. Tom. He's a pediatrician in Santa Barbara. He fell so in love with Haiti that he went three times a year and did health clinics down there because he went on this trip. People came each year. I led this trip for four years. And the last trip that I led, here's a picture of the guy that accompanied our trip you might recognize him. We were dating at the time, and just to give you a little bit of background with Ephraim with me, is he knew all of my heartbreaks. He knew the pastor I was with down there. He thought we were going to get married. I said, no, we broke up. He goes, that's okay. I'm praying for you, sister. And then I got engaged, and he said, yes. And then I got unengaged, and he said, that's okay. I'm praying for you, sister. And so when I came down to Haiti with this guy that I was dating, the two of them led worship at El Shaddai, and he loved him. He thought he was such a great guy. And wouldn't you know that the next picture shows that my boyfriend at the time felt God speaking to him all week about proposing to me at the end of the week. The last night in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, with the whole mission team around as we were doing team affirmation, suddenly my fairly introverted husband stands up and says, could everybody just please stay here for a minute? And then he gives this whole speech that I think he's just affirming me, and I'm like so embarrassed, you know, and all of a sudden he gets down on one knee. And, and if you can look at the picture before, you can see that I'm dressed exactly as you would want to be when you get engaged. It was just a beautiful, I mean, I, you know, I had a cold, so I had snot dripping down my nose. It was awesome. But you know what? It was perfect. Because I got engaged in the city of my friend who had been praying for me, for me literally for over 10 years to find the right guy. But that's not the end of the story. 
when my wedding rolled around, one of the women on, on our mission trip, her name was Gail, for her wedding gift, she flew Ephraim to Santa Barbara so he could be one of the pastors at our wedding. And that's what this next photo shows, that Ephraim came to Santa Barbara and he was one of the pastors who married my husband and I. What a story God had. We are still involved in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. We are still involved in the nightmare that's happening right now with the gangs and the kidnapping, and there's so much going on in the world that you probably don't even know it, except that you have a young lady on your campus. Ruve, where are you? Are you out there somewhere? There's Ruve. Wow, great hair. I love you. So just Yesterday, I said to Ruve, you have to ask your father if he knows Ephraim because I'm telling a story of my friend Ephraim. And I sent him a message, Ephraim, on WhatsApp, and I gave him her father's name, and he wrote back to me, he is my best friend. He's my best friend. The two of us are the only ones of that generation of pastors, of Nazarene pastors who have actually stayed in Haiti. The rest have gone because it's so hard here. How could I have known that the one college that I'm doing this year is the college that my friend's best friend's daughter would happen to be attending? You wanna tell me there is no God? That is a coincidence that is very difficult to explain. And that is the way God works. He keeps writing your story. And some of you, as we talked about two days ago, are in the middle of a storm and you can't see your way out right now. You don't know what God is doing, but he is writing a story. And you hold on to him. You've got to stay in that boat with him. And sometimes it takes a long time. That's how God's stories are. So we're going to go back to the story. Silence in the room as Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. But you can imagine what the Pharisees thought. Nobody had the authority to forgive sins except God. So Jesus was being very intentional in what he was doing. And then after he said that, he healed the man, and he got up and walked, and everybody was celebrating as he danced his way out, and everybody's applauding. The Pharisees, however, were not applauding. They were not applauding because of what Jesus said. And it's interesting the order that Jesus chose. He didn't heal the man first and say, that's really the real deal, but by the way, your sins are forgiven. No, he said, your sins are forgiven because he wanted to heal the man spiritually before he healed him physically. Now that's the weird thing about God, is that his work is invisible. But spiritual healing is the only kind of healing that lasts. Think about it, the man was healed, but eventually he died. I hate to break it to you, but I've read the statistics, 10 out of 10 die. Everyone dies. So physical healing, as spectacular as it is, and we tend to glorify it so much, but it's temporary. Because you might be healed, but eventually you'll die. It's just a matter of timing. But God has a plan beyond this life. This life is only part of the story. Your life here is only part of the story. So death is not the end of the story. That's why we sing and talk about Jesus who is alive. He died on that cross for us. And then he rose from the dead. So we will rise from the dead too if we trust him. That's what God gives us. And that's why Jesus was prioritizing the spiritual healing. But isn't it interesting that Jesus meets the needs of everyone in the room? He's always working in everyone's story. I have a quote from my book that says, the way Jesus ministers reveals how God can work in multiple ways 
in multiple people all at once. I think back to the story I had in my mind, me and this guy and the pastor and team ministry, and we were going to go to Haiti once and then come back and have our little team ministry. That's an okay story. That's a good story. But God had a better story. He had a story that he was just using that to connect me with this man, Ephraim, who was going to be in my life forever. We are lifelong friends. We've known each other for 25 years. We are now doing a video series together that we just filmed in the Dominican Republic last summer. He is my lifelong friend. And God has done amazing things in people in Santa Barbara and in Haiti because of the friendship that we have. God wants a bigger story for you. That's what we talked about yesterday. But the way I want to end chapel today is to talk about those friends. Because I'm going to leave today, and you all are still going to be here. And I am going to challenge you that you need friends. But here's the thing that we do when we need friends. We go about trying to find friends who will love us. But the way that you find friends, brothers and sisters, is to be a friend. It's to be a friend. And I'm not talking about phone friends. Do you know that most of the people now on Instagram are not even real? They're AIs. You guys need real friends. Phone friends are okay. But you need the kind that are going to carry you to Jesus when you need to be carried to Jesus. You need the kind that are going to influence you in positive ways that are going to speak truth into your life, even when you don't want to hear it. You need the friends who are going to be there to listen to you, to hold you, to come up to the altar with you, to pray for you, to be with you. I want to show you a friend that I have. Her name is Melissa. Melissa came into my life because I was engaged to a Marine, and she is married to one. He's retired now. And the chaplain put us together, said, you guys should meet each other because my fiance and her husband were going to be deployed. And as you know, I ended up breaking up with that guy, but Melissa and I stayed together. I believe she was the reason I even met my fiance. She stuck with me through the breakup. She kept believing that God had a bigger story. She said, I know he's not through, and I'm going to keep praying until we see the end of the story. And she went through boyfriend after boyfriend and date after date, and she hoped and she prayed. And then when I got married, of course, she was one of my bridesmaids. But I told you, God writes great stories. We raised our boy with their family. And Melissa was not only married to a Marine, her father-in-law was a three-star general under Norman Schwarzkopf, and her son is now a recon Marine. He is actually out in the Mediterranean right now, and so you can pray for him. And that is the reason for this next picture, because on the left, you will see Melissa's son. And on the right, you will see what Jordan decided to become because of the influence of this family. Nobody can write a story like that except for God. What story does he want to write in your life? I want to stop talking so we can get the band up here. And I want to invite you one last time. I know God has been stirring in you because I've heard from many of you. I know God has been stirring in so many different ways. But today's time is for you to possibly consider if you do not know God or have never said yes to God, that's really all it is. It's just saying yes to him. He will will walk the 99 steps. All you have to do is the one yes to say, yes, I want you to come in. Yes, I believe If that's something that you want to do this morning, I don't want to leave without giving you that opportunity. And then the secondary thing that I want to challenge you is that some of you need friends. You need 
to start finding good friends. Some of you have them. They're sitting right next to you. But you need each other. And if you're willing to commit to love and to serve the people on this campus, to change this campus, God can work after I'm done. Maybe that's his plan. And if that's in your heart, I want to invite you to come forward too. So I'm going to pray right now. The band's going to come up. And I just want you to listen to God. Lord, if there's anyone in this place that maybe has wondered if you're real, maybe sits in chapel and sees other people raising their hands, hasn't really known, but maybe has been touched this week, Lord, I pray, I pray that you would open hearts today. And if there are people in here that know that they need good friends and they want to start being a good friend to influence, to pray, to hold people through their story, to believe for their friends. Maybe they need to bring their friend up to the altar. Lord, I pray for this campus to transform into an incredible, safe place for people to grow in their relationship with you in a culture that's hard right now. God, we know you're at work. And Holy Spirit, I just give you this space to do your work. In Jesus' name, amen.